University of Buckingham, Money, Banking and Financial Markets, Summer Term 2020, Lecture 8, Exchange Rates and the International Financial System. Before we start the lecture, the usual slide to show that the student experience is still here for you. And this slide has information on the Students' Union, Career Service, Student Conduct and Students First. Contents of Lecture 8, we will look at exchange rates, which is simply the price of money in terms of um, one country's money in terms of another country's money, and the international financial system. A brief overview. So the learning objectives are to explain how the foreign exchange market works and why f exchange rates are of importance, to identify the main factors that affect ex exchange rates in the long run, to look at um, supply and demand curves for foreign exchange market and interpret the equilibrium in the market for foreign exchange and list and illustrate the factors that affect the exchange rates in the short run. Content of lecture 8 we will look at exchange rates which is simply the price of money in terms of um, one country's money in terms of another country's money and the international financial system a brief overview well what is the foreign exchange market the exchange rate is just simply the price of one currency in terms of another currency it's how many um, pounds you get for a dollar or how many euros you get for a pound and so on. The foreign exchange market is a financial market where exchange rates are determined. Spot tra transactions are immediate to the exchange of bank deposits and there is a spot exchange rate which is the um, rate of one currency in terms of another now and of course there's a possibility of four transactions the exchange of bank deposits at some specified future date at a forward exchange rate. Let's look at some, some terms. Appreciation is when a currency rises in value relative to another currency. In other words, if the dollar rises in value relative to the pound, it means you each dollar buys you more pounds. Depreciation is when a currency falls in value relative to other currency. If sterling depreciates against the euro, it means that sterling buys fewer and fewer euros. When a country's currency appreciates, the country's goods become more expensive to foreigners. In other words, the price of exports of the country which appreciates in world markets become more expensive. On the other hand, foreign goods in that country become less expensive domestic agents. In other words, the price of imports into that country becomes cheaper. And let's look at the over-the-counter market, which is mainly banks. Uh, foreign exchange dealings between banks is known as the over-the-counter market. Exchange rates in the long run, well, the law of one price assumes that the prices of an identical good should be the same throughout the world if trade barriers are low. And of course, in the case of exchange rates, uh, the, each country's currency is an identical good, uh, which means that the should be the the price of goods, if uh, world trade barriers are low, should equate the relative price should equate to the. To the um, between domestic and foreign prices should eventually equate to the exchange rate between these countries in the long run. And this is, uh, comes from the theory of purchasing power parity, which assumes that all goods are identical in both countries, trade barriers and transportation costs are low, however many goods and services are not traded across borders, but the theory of purchasing power parity will assume that most goods actually are otherwise there will be differences in purchase power parity let's look at nominal versus exchange real exchange rates the real exchange rate is the rate at which domestic goods can be exchanged for foreign goods for example let's consider a basket of goods in new york 
um, worth 50 US dollars. And then let's, let's look at the same basket of goods, identical basket of goods. If this costs um, 7,500 Japanese yen in Tokyo. And let's assume that the normal exchange rate is 100 Japanese yen per US dollar. However, the real exchange rate is how many foreign goods you can buy by paying one unit of domestic goods. Goods, not foods. So in the above equation, the real rate, in other words, what you can actually buy, is going to be 50 multiplied by 100 divided by 7,500. So the exchange rate, the real exchange rate, is actually 0.66, depending upon the relative cost in the two countries of buying a, um, an identical bundle of goods, basket of goods. Purchasing power parity theories predicts that in the long run, the real exchange rate between um, the currencies will be equal to 1. In other words, the currency will move so that the domestic costs uh, and foreign costs of buying a basket of goods will be equated. But of course, this doesn't always happen. Let's look here, um, uh, purchasing power parity. Let's look at the United States versus the United Kingdom, 1973 to 2017, uh, index March 1973 equals 100. Now we can divide the relative price levels to give us what should be the purchasing power parity, which is this, an approximation could be the consumer price index in the UK divided by the consumer price index in the United States. Of course, these baskets are not identical, but they're close as possible. And you can see there um, that the real exchange rate has uh, moved it from round about 100 to just over 150. Where the nominal exchange rate, in other words, the spot rate, has been going up and down in terms of the, um, the purchase and power parity rate. Now the argument is, if this is the long run rate, the purchase and power parity, if the exchange rate is below it, this means that the um, currency has got some, uh, some possibility of moving up to the long term, to its long term rate. Let's look at application. Uh, what's the famous Bergenomics, which the economist puts together the Big Mac indices and purchasing power parity. Since 1986, The Economist magazine has published the Big Mac index as a light-hearted guide to whether currencies are at their correct level, based on the theory of purchasing power parity. Big Macs are sold by McDonald's all around the world and are supposed to taste the same wherever they are sold. Therefore, you've talked about an identical good. So The Economist collects prices in local currencies of Big Mac sold in 56 different regions and countries, then uses these prices to compare the exchange rate implied by the purchase and power parity theory from the Big Mac in index. So you get the implied PPP from the Big Mac index and compare that with the nominal exchange rate to see whether or not the currency is under or, or overvalued in comparison to its long-term rate. Well, what affects exchange rates in the long run? The basic rule is anything that increases the demand for domestically produced goods relative to foreign traded goods will tend to appreciate the domestic currency. And these factors are relative price levels, um, trade barriers, preferences for domestic versus foreign goods, relative preferences, If uh, world consumers have a preference for German cars compared to their own cars, then that would tend to put up the price of the um, euro, and before that, before the euro, the Deutsche Mark. Also, differences in levels of productivity will, in fact, affect long-run exchange rates. See so some of the tables that affect them in the long run. If the domestic um, price level goes up, the response of the exchange rate should be to push the exchange rate down. 
If trade barriers go up, this would tend to push the exchange rate up. Import demand pushes the exchange rate down. Export demand pushes the exchange rate up. An increase in productivity should increase the exchange rate. What about the short run? Because of course we've got these long run um, exchange rates. For example, you saw the, the one based upon the price level for the US and in, in, in the UK in terms of a uh, ratio of C, uh, CPI. That's the long term ratio, which didn't change very much. But of course, in the short term, the exchange rate changes quite a lot. And currencies can have particularly long periods where they are not at the uh, equilibrium long run rate. Well, a spot exchange rate is just simply the price of a domestic currency, let's say dollar assets if we're taking from the US, in terms of foreign assets. So what determines it is the supply curve for domestic assets, which in the case of, uh, of US money is just a uh, domestic financial asset. So let's assume that the amount of domestic assets is fixed, the supply curve is vertical. Let's look at the demand curve for domestic assets. The most important determinant is, is the relative expected return on domestic assets. So at lower current values of the dollar, everything else has been equal, the quantity of demanded of dollar assets would be higher. So here is the equilibrium in the foreign exchange market looking at uh, euros to dollars. The S is the supply of dollar assets, which we assume is, is fixed. The demand curve uh, slopes downwards in terms of the exchange rate of euros for dollars. If we're at point A, this means there is an excess supply of dollar assets compared to the demand for dollar assets at point A. This would put pressure on the value of the dollar relative to the euro, pushing down the depreciating rate of the dollar until we reach the equilibrium at point B, where the supply of um, assets equals the demand for assets. If, on the other hand, we're at point C, at this case, the, there's an excess demand for dollar assets compared to the supply of dollar assets. This would then lead to bidding to um, buy dollar assets, which would push up the, the demand for dollar assets. Uh, the excess demand for dollar assets would push up the value of the dollar compared to the euro until it gets back to the equilibrium at E star. How do we have changes in exchange rate? Well, there can be all sorts of changes in the demand for domestic assets. What would change the demand for, for example, dollar assets, domestic assets, if we're looking at the dollar? Well, the dollar interest rates, what are the interest rates that you can return by buying assets in dollar terms? Uh, and then compare that with the foreign interest rate and also what the expected future exchange rate will shift the demand for dollar assets. So let's see what happens if there's an increase in the domestic interest rate. With initial equilibrium, E1, where the supply of dollar assets equals the demand for dollar assets, <coughs> If the Federal Reserve puts up interest rates, this would mean that interest rates in the United States would increase relative to interest rates in Europe, for example. So a rise in the domestic interest rate shifts the demand curve to the right from D1 to D2. The new equilibrium at point two would be where the supply equals of dollar assets equals demand for dollar assets at the new equilibrium equilibrium level on the new demand curve D2 and this would lead to a rise upwards in the exchange rate of the dollar in compared to the euro. What happens if in contrast there's an increase in the foreign interest rate so the dollar interest rate stays the same but interest rates um, set by the European Central Bank 
rise relative to the dollar. Supply of dollar assets stays the same in terms of S. We have our initial equilibrium um, based at one, based upon where the supply of dollar assets equals the demand for dollar assets. If the European Central Bank raises the foreign assets um, interest rate, this would shift the um, demand curve for dollar assets to the left because the demand for euro assets would be rising. This leads to a new equilibrium at point two, and this would be what the result of this would be a fall in the exchange rate, the depreciation of the dollar, and of course a relative rise in the um, the relative value of the euro. What about um, an expectation of a future change in the exchange rate? Again, we have our supply of dollar assets being constant. We assume that it doesn't change. We have the initial equilibrium at point one, downward slope and demand curve for dollar assets. In terms of the exchange rate, if there is going to be um, expect rise in the exchange rate, this would shift the demand curve to, to the right. In other words, it would, if there's going to be expected um, future rise in the exchange rate, the demand for dollar assets would shift outwards. This then brings about uh, a rise in the exchange rate so the expectations become fulfilled. And here we have the different um, impacts which you can um, study at your leisure. Factors changing the domestic interest rate, changing the foreign interest rate, changing the domestic price level, trade barriers, expected import demand, export, export demand, productivity, and we actually have the direction of changes in the demand for uh, domestic assets at the, each exchange rate and the response of the exchange rate. Uh, to dollar euro assets, either appreciation or depreciation, and some of the uh, some of the effects um, of these changes in graphical form. Let's see what actually happens with this effect of changes in interest rates on the ex equilibrium exchange rate. How does it actually work? If there's a change in interest rates, if domestic re real interest rate rises, the domestic currency will appreciate. When domestic interest rates rise due to an expected increase in inflation, for example, the domestic currency depreciates. So there are two different impacts. If the real interest rate rises, the currency would appreciate. But if nominal interest rates rise because of an increase in inflation, in other words, real interest rates effectively fall, then the domestic currency would fall. What impact does the change in the money supply have? A higher domestic money supply would cause the domestic currency to depreciate. So the Federal Reserve pumping out more and more dollars should lead to a depreciation in the dollar. These movements in foreign exchange rates as a result of the return on assets, uh, financial assets, come about because of something called interest rate parity. If we're comparing the expected returns on domestic and foreign assets, there are foreign currency transactions which are actually due to exports and imports. But most of the um, real world transactions in currency markets actually involve agents buying and selling currencies based on their values as assets. So there's actually investment and the speculation rather than the underlying patterns of foreign trade. In this case, it's important to develop an understanding of how assets are valued. 
So from the perspective of the American economic agent, the expected return on dollar denominated assets is of course equal to the domestic interest rate. For a foreign economic agent, called Francois the foreigner, for example, the expected return on dollar denominated assets is equal to the rate of interest associated with those same assets, in other words, the um, rate of interest uh, of domestic assets in dollar terms. But this has to be adjusted for the expected appreciation or depreciation in the value of the US dollar relative to the euro. If foreign and American bank deposits could be considered perfect substitutes for one another and as perfect capital mobility, then there will be parity between the interest rate on dollar-denominated bank deposits and the interest rate on euro-denominated bank deposits because of the movement in capital. This notion is summarised in the following equation. The interest rate on dollar-denominated assets must equal the interest rates on foreign do, do, uh, assets minus the expected uh, in, Exchange rate in T plus 1 minus exchange rate in T divided by the exchange rate in T. In other words, minus the appreciation or depreciation of the uh, exchange rate. <coughs> and if these exchange rates move um, so that they become equalised, then the interest rate on dollars will equal the interest rates on foreign assets with perfect capital mobility because the exchange rate will... Um, move to actually neutralize any expected change rates and this equation is known as the interest parity condition let's look at some movements um, in exchange rates the, for example the brexit vote and the british pound the brexit vote in the united kingdom led to a nearly 10 percent depreciation of the british pound from one dollar 48 just before the votes to one dollar thirty six. What explains the large one day decline in the exchange rate? It is explained by the fact that the fear that the United Kingdom asset value of assets would, would, would fall. Let's look at the international financial system. What's the learning objectives? Using graphs and uh, treasury accounts to illustrate the distinctions between the effects of sterilized and unsterilized interventions on foreign exchange markets. <clears throat> to interpret the relationships among the current account, the capital account, and official reserve transactions balance held at the central bank. To identify the mechanisms for maintaining a fixed exchange rate and ass assess the challenges faced by fixed exchange rate regimes and to summarise the advantages and disadvantages of capital controls. We'll look at the role of the IMF as an international lender of last resort. We'll look at ways in which international monetary policy and exchange rate arrangements can affect domestic monetary policy operations and summarise the advantages and disadvantages of exchange rate targeting. Let's look at foreign exchange intervention and the money supply. Looking at the Federal Reserve from the perspective of um, f assets and liabilities, deposits with the Fed, foreign assets and currency in circulation. So a central bank's purchase of domestic currency and corresponding sale of foreign assets in the foreign exchange market would lead to an equal decline in its international reserves and in the monetary base. On the other hand, the central bank sale of domestic currency to purchase foreign assets in the foreign exchange market would result in an equal rise in its international reserves and in the monetary base. Unsterilized foreign exchange intervention An unsterilized intervention in which domestic currency is sold to purchase foreign assets leads to a gain in international reserves, an increase in money supply and a depreciation of the domestic currency. And here's the effect of an unsterilized purchase of dollars and sale of foreign assets. We have in step one, we have a purchase of dollars, which decreases the monetary base. 
and the money supply, raising domestic interest rates, and shifting the demand curve right to D2. So we move from an equilibrium of E1 after the shift to an equilibrium of E2, and we have a, a higher domestic interest rate, and this will actually lead to a rise in the exchange rate. There'll be an appreciation the exchange rate up to 0.82 from E1. What is a sterilised foreign exchange intervention? Well, the central bank, in this case the Federal Reserve, may not want to see a rise in the exchange rate. So to counter the effect of the foreign exchange intervention, you conduct, uh, the central bank will conduct an offsetting open market operation to sterilise the impact on the exchange rate. In this case, there is no, um, the, the government bonds are bought, foreign assets are sold. This means there's no change in the monetary base or reserves and there's no effect on the exchange rate. What's the balance of payments? The balance of payments is a bookkeeping system, simply bookkeeping system used to record all receipts and payments that have a direct effect on the movement of funds between a nation and foreign countries. The current account looks at international transactions that involve currently produced goods and services. And of course, there's a, a trade balance of trade, which can be a deficit or a surplus. The capital account looks at net receipts surplus or deficit from capital transactions and the sum of the two the current account and capital account is the official reserves transactions balance the united states is running a very very large current account deficit should there be a, this should be a cause of concern well persistent balance of payments deficits are a concern for several reasons First, it indicates that the current exchange rates, foreign demand for US exports, is far less than the US demand for foreign goods. Second, a current account deficit means that foreigners' claims on US assets is growing, one of the reasons why China has been building a big surplus and, in consequentially, owns a large part of um, US uh, treasury assets. Let's look at exchange rate regimes in the international financial system. Um, we have fixed exchange rate, re, exchange rate regimes. In this, the value of a currency is pegged, fixed, relative to the value of one other currency called the anchor currency. We can have a floating exchange rate regime. In this case, the value of a currency is allowed to fluctuate against all other currencies. Or we can have a managed float regime or a dirty float where there's an attempt by the central bank to influence exchange rates by, by buying and selling currencies. Let's look at exchange rate regimes historically. Gold standard. Before the First World War, most countries were on the gold standard. So the fixed exchange rates, the exchange rate was fixed in relationship to the value of gold. This meant that countries had effectively no control of a monetary policy and inflation and deflation and prices were influenced heavily by the production of gold and gold discoveries. In during the 1930s, many countries came off the gold standard and there were competitive devaluations. After the end of the Second World War, the Bretton Woods system was set up, which lasted to more or less 1973. The Bretton Woods system was a fixed exchange rate system using the dollar as a reserve currency. The dollar was fixed in terms of a given price of gold, so it was convertible into gold, and other currencies pegged their exchange rates to the value of the dollar and then implicitly to the value of gold. The International Monetary Fund was set up to act as a lender of last resort uh, for countries which had fundamental problems with their balance of payments. Um, to prevent uh, devaluations or revaluations, the International Monetary Fund, if the country was having a disequilibrium, would act to lend money in the short term until the problems had been resolved. 
the Brentwood system, um, the financial system after the Second World War also included the World Bank. The World Bank's purpose was to aid countries in terms of economic development and the general agreement on tra tariffs and trade to try and push for multilateral free trade, which eventually became the World Trade Organization. Another important um, regime system uh, was the European monetary system. This was a fixed exchange rate system instituted among European Union mem members. Of, it was an exchange rate mechanism where currencies were European currencies were more or less fixed in a constant in a constant but slightly fluctuating rate to the Deutsche Mark. This of course eventually How did the Bretton Woods system work? Exchange rates were adjusted in, in um, large movements, but those would only happen when there was a fundamental disequilibrium, large persistent deficits in the balance of payments. And this of course happened in Britain and there was a devaluation in 1967. The IMF made loans to cover losses in international reserves where central banks were fighting to um, keep the exchange rate at its fixed level, as, as agreed in the Bretton Woods system against the dollar. In many cases, the IMF encouraged contractionary monetary policies in order to try and slow economies of down and <coughs> correct um, balance of payments deficits. Devaluation was agreed only if IMF loans were not sufficient to prevent the um, loss of reserves. No tools were in place for surplus countries. Many pressures uh, for Japan and Germany to revalue. And of course the US could not devalue its currency. It was fixed in terms of gold. How does a fixed exchange rate regime work? When a domestic currency is overvalued, the central bank must purchase domestic currency to keep the exchange rate fixed. And then, of course, it's losing international reserves or conduct um, a devaluation. When the domestic currency is undervalued, the central bank must then sell domestic currency to keep the exchange rate fixed and again international reserves or conduct a revaluation. Let's look at intervention in the foreign exchange market under a fixed exchange rate regime. Let's say first we have an overvalued exchange rate. We have the vertical access to the exchange rate, foreign currency in terms of domestic currency. On the horizontal uh, axis we have quantity of domestic assets. We assume both cases the supply of domestic ac assets is fixed. And then we have our first equilibrium exchange rate E1. Now let's assume the exchange rate is overvalued at um, E par and should fall to E1. To keep the exchange rate at E par, the central bank would have to purchase domestic currency to shift the demand curve to D2. So it is effectively intervening. If on the other hand the, um, we have the opposite situation and the exchange rate is undervalued at E par and there uh, would be a tendency for it to rise to E1, to prevent this and to keep the exchange rate at E par, the central bank then sells the best of currency and aims to shift the demand curve to D2. So an overvalued uh, exchange rate, central bank purchases domestic currency to shift the demand curve to D2, and undervalued exchange rate, the central bank sells domestic currency to shift the demand curve inwards to D2. In the European monetary system, eight members of the European Economic Community fix exchange rates with one another and then floated these against the US dollar. The EQ, as it was called, value was tied to a basket of specified amounts of European currencies. 
and this fluctuated within fairly small limits. It did lead to a foreign exchange crisis. The uh, pound was a member and was forced out of the system in 1992. Let's see what happened in the foreign exchange market for British pounds in 1992. <clears throat> the pound is obviously fixed at a particular level into the system, which includes um, a level in terms of the other currencies, but in particular in terms of the Deutschmark. Here we have the quantity of um, the supply of British pound assets. We have the par value at 2.778. We have the equilibrium. But in step one, there's an increase in German interest rates, which shifts the demand curve to the left. In other words, people are want to sell sterling. This puts pressure. Uh, British uh, reserves are being used to actually buy sterling, but the expectation in the market that Britain would eventually devalue will shift the demand curve further to the left because there's an expectation of a further fall. This requires, so the, the par value, the market's pushing it to E2, and then an expectation that Britain will not um, be able to maintain the par value pushes it down further to E3. This step three, which requires a much greater purchase of British pounds to shift the demand curve as far as possible back to e D1 to try and keep uh, the exchange rate at E par. So the Bank of England is effectively using its, its reserves of foreign currencies and foreign assets to actually purchase British pounds to try and push the demand curve for British assets from D3 to D1 to counteract the foreign selling. Of course, in the end, it didn't work. And this brings us to what's called the policy trilemma, the impossible trinity. Known as um, Fleming Mundell, it's possible to actually have a fixed exchange rate and an independent monetary policy or free capital mobility and an independent monetary policy or free capital um, mobility in a fixed exchange rate, but it is actually impossible to have all three. How did China accumulate 4 trillion of international reserves? By 2014, China had accumulated US 4 trillion in international reserves. Why? China saw rapid growth in productivity, accompanied by an inflation rate lower than that of the US. This caused the long run value of the yuan to increase. The Chinese central bank encouraged in very, very large purchases of the US dollar assets to maintain the fixed relationship between the Chinese yuan and the US dollar. What are monetary unions in the international financial system? A monetary union is a variant of a fixed exchange rate regime where a set of co countries agree to um, have the same currency. For example, e EMU, the European Monetary Union, where the current countries have come together to do effectively use the same exchange rate. They're fixing their exchange rates um, completely in terms of uh, the value for each other. What are the pros of a currency a monetary union? Trade across borders is easier. The cons, individual countries no longer have their own independent monetary policies. What is a managed float? A managed float is a hybrid of a fixed and flexible exchange rate system. Small daily changes are, will occur in response to market, but there will be interventions by the central bank to prevent large fluctuations, in other words, pushing the exchange rate in a particular direction.
Rates fluctuate in response to market forces, but not, are not determined solely by them, in, for example the Chinese one. Why? Because appreciation hurts exporters and hurts employment, and depreciation hurts imports, imports and stimulates inflation. Let's look at some global issues in the international financial system. Will the euro survive? The global financial crisis of 2007 to 2009 led to an economic contraction throughout Europe, with the countries in the southern part of the eurozone hit especially hard. Adopting easier monetary policies in the southern countries is not a possible option because of the, central, the European Central Bank's standardised uh, interest rate. Although, as a result of the financial crisis and the continued problems with um, deflationary pressures afterwards, monetary policy has been eased generally across the euro system. This straight jacket effect of the euro has weakened support for the euro in the southern countries, leading to increased talks of abandoning the euro and these, these, these um, political pressures continue. Mundell's trilemma concerned the impossibility of being able to have capital controls, flexible exchange rate and uh, independent monetary policy to have all three. Let's look at capital controls. Well, restrictions on capital mobility, especially hot money, can help avoid financial instability. So controls on capital outflows can promote financial stability by forcing a, a, a devaluation. If the controls aren't in place, they are seldom effective and may actually increase capital flight. They can lead to corruption and it can mean an opportunity is lost to improve the economy. Controls on capital inflows, while well, capital inflows can lead to a lending boom and excessive risk taken by financial intermediaries. The controls may block funds for productive uses, produce substantial distortions and a misallocation of resources, and can of course also lead to corruption. Instead of capital controls, there's a stronger case for improving bank regulation and supervision. Let's look now at the role of the IMF, International Monetary Fund. It was originally set up under the Bretton Woods system to help countries deal with balance of payments problems and stand by the fixed exchange rate system by lending to deficit countries. If there is a problem in a, one particular country, the role of the IMF may be able to prevent cont contagion to other countries. It acts as an international land of last resort, but the safety net it provides, as with central banks and individual uh, banking systems, may lead to excessive risk taking, so there's a moral hazard problem. Again, consider the problems with Argentina. How should the IMF operate? Well, it may not be tough enough, but not put enough pressure on governments. Austerity programs focus on tight macroeconomic policies rather than financial reforms. Its operations may be too slow, which will worsen the crisis and increase costs. Many countries are restricted from borrowing from the IMF until the recent subprime financial crisis of 2007-2009. Monetary policy can be affected by international matters in several ways. First, balance of payment considerations. Current account deficits in the United States suggest that American businesses may be losing the ability to compete 
because the dollar has been too strong at times. US deficits imply surpluses in other countries, which will produce large increases in the international reserves holdings, causing potentially world inflation or even um, world deflation if these reserves are not used. Let's look at exchange rate considerations. Given the international conditions in monetary policy, a contractionary upon monetary policy will raise the domestic interest rate and strengthen the currency. On the other hand, an expansionary monetary policy will lower interest rates and weaken the currency. Let's look at the question of whether to peg or not to peg. Saudi Arabia, for example, and the United Arab Emirates pegs their um, currency to the dollar. Let's look at exchange rate targeting as an alternative monetary policy strategy. What's the advantage of exchange rate targeting? It contributes to keeping inflation under control. It provides an automatic rule for the conduct of monetary policy. It's simple and it's clear. What are the disadvantages of exchange rate targeting? Central bank cannot respond to domestic shocks easily and shocks to the anchor country of which the, uh, your currency is um, targeted at are then transmitted. It leads to the possibility of speculative attacks on the currency and it weakens the accountability of policy makers as the exchange rate loses value as a signal. When is exchange rate targeting desirable for industrialized countries? It's desirable if domestic monetary and political institutions are not conducive to good policy making. Again, take the case of Argentina. Of course, there are other important benefits such as integration which arise from the strategy. And what is one of the reasons that exchange rate targeting was um, considered as part of the EMS before the euro was formed, with the weaker currencies trying to target their relationship to the Deutsche Mark. When is it desirable for emerging market countries? Targeting for emerging market countries is desirable if, again, political and ministry institutions are weak. The strategy then becomes a stabilization policy of last resort. What are currency boards? A currency board is an arrangement which the domestic currency is backed 100% by a foreign currency. Take the Hong Kong and the US dollar. A stronger commitment to a fixed exchange rate by the central bank. <coughs> a solution to the lack of transparency in the commitment to target. The note issuing authority establishes a fixed exchange rate and stands ready to exchange currency at this rate. The money supply can expand only when the foreign currency is exchanged for domestic currency, which can help control inflation. On the other hand, there's the loss of independent monetary policy and an increased exposure to shocks from the anchor country, and a loss of ability to create money and for the central bank to act as a lender of last resort. Let's look at um, Argentina's currency board. The currency board experiment in Argentina was initially a steady success, with inflation falling from 800% in 1990 to less than 5% in 1994. Due though to the long-term weaknesses in Argentine exports and bad timing, the currency board system ultimately ended in widespread violence and bloodshed in January 2002. Dollarization. Dollarization is another solution to the lack of transparency and commitment, and it's the adoption of another country's money completely. It could be the US dollar or it could be another current currency. This is, uh, gives an even stronger commitment mechanism. It completely avoids the possibility of speculative attacks on the domestic currency. Of course, they are, um, independent monetary policy is lost, and again, there are increased exposure to shocks from the anchor country.
the central bank has an inability to create money and to act as a lend of last resort. And finally, there's a loss of the income um, from our seniorage. Thank you very much.